Buenos días, eh, soy el doctor Pablo González, eh, neurólogo y epileptólogo del Centro Avanzado de Epilepsia de Clínica Las Condes. Eh, les damos la, una cálida bienvenida a todos eh, a este quinto webinar organizado por el Centro Avanzado de Epilepsia de Clínica Las Condes. Eh, tenemos la oportunidad de interactuar con destacados especialistas y en esta oportunidad nuestro invitado es el profesor Eugene Trinca de Austria con el tema Update on, on Diagnosis and Treatment of Status Epiléptico. Eh, doctor Trinca es neurólogo y psiquiatra, jefe del Departamento de Neurología para Celsius Medical University de Salzburg, eh, Austria, eh, y la ANCAA eh, Chair eh, y miembro de Picker European Reference Network. Eh, posterior a la presentación del doctor Trinca, haremos las preguntas y respuestas. Eh, los invitamos a hacer las preguntas a través del chat. Eh, con un signo de interrogación en el cuadrante de derecho y se han discutido en una mesa redonda al finalizar la presentación. Y las preguntas van a llegar al moderador. En este caso, nuestro moderador en el chat eh, será el doctor David Martínez, neurólogo y epileptólogo acá del Centro de Epilepsia de Clínica Las Condes, que actualmente se encuentra en Cleveland. Eh, doctor Trinca, welcome. Eh, your presentation. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for your introduction and uh, best regards uh, and hello to Chile and to all over the world, wherever you are. I hope we have... Okay. okay. So, um, well, the, the main thing is about the classification. Uh, status epilepticus has been redefined as a seizure which does not stop spontaneously uh, after a certain time point T1. So for the generalized tonic-clonic or bilateral tonic-clonic status, it's five minutes. This is what we know from the epilepsy monitoring unit studies, that the seizure doesn't last longer than usually three minutes. Once it exceeds five minutes, uh, it's very likely that it doesn't stop. And after a certain time point, which we call T2, it's half an hour, uh, then we expect that there is brain damage due to excitotoxicity. It's not uh, only um, the running out of fuel, it's cytotoxicity to glutamatergic activity. Uh, in the focal status with impaired consciousness, it's different. The time point T1 is around 10 minutes and it takes about one hour uh, until brain damage occurs. And in absent status, it's not so clear when T1 is and one T2, so it's unknown. T1 was set arbitrarily at 10 minutes for working purposes. So there are basically two types. It's the convulsive types of status and the non-convulsive types. And again, here in the non-convulsive, you have those with coma and those without coma. And it's very clear that they fall into different categories. So that's our taxonomic criteria. How often does status occur? It's increasing with age. So the most common um, uh, age where status epilepticus occurs are the elderly, and this is the increasing population. It's up to 80 per 100,000 per year in the population above 60. Uh, and around 38 to 39 per 100,000 per year overall in adults, and it's slightly lower in children. In children is the highest incidence in the first year of life. So there is a form of status which is refractory to treatment, and this is what we call refractory and super refractory status. This is status going on for more than 48 hours, even adequate uh, treatment and anesthesia. That's a rare condition, but if it occurs, it's a very severe condition. There are two studies, one from Finland and one from uh, Salzburg, where the incidence is 7.2 or 1.2 per 100,000 adults per year. And in Finland, it's slightly different, it's 3.4 and uh, 0 0.7. But the confidence intervals are overlapping, so I assume that this is uh, truly the, uh, the incidence what we find. So the classification has four axes. Uh, it's semiology, etiology, EEG, and age. So the semiological axis basically represents the types of status epilepticus. And as I said, 
you can have those with prominent um, motor symptoms and those without prominent motor symptoms. And each of them has subcategories, convulsive, myoclonic, focal motor, tonic status, hyperkinetic status, um, non-convulsive forms with coma, without coma. Here you have the typical absences, atypical absences and myoclonic absence status, which are different categories. And then the broad range of focal status without prominent motor symptoms, sensory, autonomic, visual, olfactory, depending on the type where they are. And uh, aphasic status is here categorized as a little bit of different because it has, of course, a very complex symptomatology. And then you have the ones where you don't know whether it's focal or generalized. Is this all academic gymnastics or does it have a um, um, meaning? And it's clearly that it is associated with the outcome. And this is what you see here. Here in, in the brownish color, you have the status with prominent motor phenomena and in the green without prominent motor phenomena. And here you have to look at the second taxonomic criterion. It's the degree of impaired consciousness somnolence, stupor, coma. And if you have that, of course, you have a poor prognosis. Case fatality, 37, 46, and 43 percent. And even if you have the focal ones, which then evolve into a non-convulsive form uh, and uh, the patient is stuporous, it's 60 percent case fatality. In the comatose patient, you need additional criteria and they can only be the EEG in order to classify it uh, appropriately, uh, but you need clear criteria. And one of these criteria has been validated by different uh, study groups. It's very easy to apply. You need a clinical suspicion of status epilepticus. You did the EEG. You look whether there are epileptiform discharges or no epileptiform discharges. When the frequency of the discharges are more than 2.5 Hertz, it's a diagnosed non-convulsive. When you have less than 2.5 Hertz, you need additional criteria like spatiotemporal evolution, subtle ictal phenomena, or uh, intravenous anti-epileptic drugs which respond. And then you can say again, it's non-convulsive. When you have no response in the EEG with anti-epileptic drugs, or when you only have fluctuation without a definitive evolution, it's possible status, but it's not 100% sure. Uh, when you don't have epileptic form discharges, but you have quasi-rhythmic delta theta activity faster than 0.5 Hertz, you again fall into the same category uh, that you can diagnose non-convulsive if you fulfill the additional criteria. But it's important to look at the clinical context because that's the only thing which really counts. You need a clinical indication. If you have Jakob Kreuzfeld, Jakob Kreuzfeld definitely fulfills the EEG criteria, but it doesn't fulfill the clinical criteria of having status epilepticus in most of the cases. The kappa value is very high, the sensitivity is high, and the specificity, uh, coma versus non-coma, hypoxic, non-hypoxic, uh, young or older children, it's the same uh, sensitivity and specificity, so it's a very um, reliable tool. So this is one of the typical EEGs uh, which you get, it's an elderly woman with a uh, intracerebral bleeding and you see fluctuations. You don't see a clear evolution pattern. Uh, so this is possible, but you need to have additional criteria like responsiveness to anti-epileptic drug or ictal phenomena. So why did we decide for 2.5 Hertz? Well, that was an expert decision. It was a good clinical reasoning. And later on, studies came which looked at support for that. This is one uh, study which comes from the group of Aaron Struck, uh, Wisconsin. He looked at those patients who had continuous EEG monitoring and underwent FDG PET during the monitoring with lateralized periodic discharges. So the SUV, the, uh, the area of interest was compared 
to the uptake in the ponds. And if there is a certain ratio, um, there's an increase in this area or in this area. So the metabolism associated with lateralized periodic discharges with 0 0.5 hertz as a baseline, remember that we had 2.5 hertz, but the 0 0.5 hertz, it was increased by a median of 100% at 1 hertz. And frequencies above hertz increased by a median of 300%. So really, if you have slower frequency, there's a, an increase in metabolic demand, which really supports our frequency decision. That's also what you see here, less than 1 hertz, 1 hertz and more than 1 hertz, and the SUV region compared to the pounds increases 100, 200, 300, 400 percent, and that's the uptake of more than 300 percent. And there's a good correlation when you look at the scatter plot. So why is it so important? Metabolic demand tells you that when the brain has an insult, it already needs more than usual, and when it has a status on top of the insult, the metabolic demand is, of course, higher and cells are more likely to die. So in the early stages, advanced stages and refractory stages of status epilepticus, you have different pathophysiological sequences. It's continuous seizure activity, high metabolic demand leads to hyperperfusion, disruption of the blood-brain barrier, vasogenic edema, uh, a shift to anaerobic metabolism and lactate accumulates. There's a failure of the sodium potassium pump, uh, water and sodium influx, cytotoxic edema, uh, and then there's a point of no return because uh, once you have that, it's very likely that there is no return to normal, irreversible neuronal damage occurs and long-term consequences. This pathophysiology can be mirrored quite nicely with neuroimaging methods. I showed you the PET results, uh, correlated it with the EEG. There are perfusion measures, which can be arterial spin labeling in the MRI, um, flare sequences, and uh, DWI uh, changes already show cytotoxic edema. So there's an increase in DWI and uh, decrease in ADC maps. Uh, and then once it's a chronic stage, um, where brain damage already occurred, you see the changes in the flare and in the T2. So what are the most often involved structures? You see here cortical structures, homolateral to the epileptogenic EEG focus. You see subcortical. Uh, these are the corticothalamic pathways. You have thalamic changes and you have hippocampal changes. These three are the most important structures which you have to look at. And they don't follow a vascular pattern, they follow a functional network pattern. So this is how you can distinguish this. Second axis, the etiology, you have to decide what is the cause of status. Status is not a disease, it's a condition. Uh, and you have to identify what causes the decision. Acute, acute stroke, intoxication, remote, can be post-encephalitic, post-traumatic, or it is a progressive disease like La Forra or or glioblastoma or other tumors. Or, and that's also one thing where a colleague contacted me today, this morning, about a pregnant lady with juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. The doctor withdrew valproic acid and the patient fell in status refractory and they had to, had to get the child with a cesarean section and the mother is still in status. That's a defined electroclinical syndrome. Or, and that's an important, it's unknown, cryptogenic. That's new onset super refractory status epilepticus and you don't know the cause, for example. Uh, the unknown group is very important. In our global survey on more than 700 patients of super refractory status, 25% 20, were of unknown cause. And uh, it's clear that this is not a diagnosis, this is a clinical presentation. Um, in a patient without active epilepsy or other pre-existing relevant um, disorders, uh, which usually can be fight, identified within the first 72 hours. So uh, the message is the common causes 
must be identified early, I would say even without, within 48 hours or less. And the uncommon causes are the problem. And these are the ones which you have to search for in NORSEC. What happens if you search intensively in these cases where you don't have the initial, you know, the big five? 20% um, are autoimmune, 18% are paraneoplastic encephalitis, and 8% are infection related. And on the right hand of the slide, you see a lot of uh, causes uh, which you find here, which are uh, which can be identified. So when you have NORSE, we have to uh, face a serious problem. And the research in the future um, uh, field should uh, identify clinical features, etiology, pathophysiology, treatments, and of course, uh, then we need funding. So we need to have public advocacy and uh, professional education and family support. Coming back to the treatment, these are the important treatments, steroids, plasma exchange, immunoglobulin, rituximab and cyclophosphamine. Do you see any anti-epileptic drugs here? No, it's not, it's anti-inflammatory. So you can treat these patients with anti-epileptic drugs until they are, you know, full of the, of the medication, but you cannot move anything. You can only move with uh, immunological treatment. So that comes, brings me to the treatment strategy. First point is identify the cause. Uh, common causes are easy. It's stroke, bleeding, infection, metabolic changes, drug withdrawal. Rare causes are the difficulty, and um, many of them have immune or metabolic or genetic causes. Uh, second is early treatment to prevent long-term consequences and brain damage. You see the brain damage already in the MRI <clears throat> in many cases when you treat not aggressively enough. So this is a <clears throat> sequential slide which is animated, but then you don't see anything anymore. The cascade of events from a single seizure to status epilepticus depends on a lot of pathophysiological factors. Ion opening and closing, neurotransmitter release, protein phosphorylation occurs within milliseconds. The second stage is receptor trafficking with a decrease of inhibitory GABA receptors. They are internalized, but NMDA receptors for glutamate are increased. And the same happens also with AMPA receptors, and that happens within minutes. After hours, there's a change in neuropeptide expression, excitatory substance P, and there is insufficient replacement of used or uh, already uh, depleted inhibitory neuropeptide Y. There are two examples, there are many more. And then uh, after days and weeks, there is uh, genetic and epigenetic changes. So it makes sense to have a treatment approach which covers these pathophysiological changes from different angles. Uh, GABAergic drugs in the early phase and non-GABAergic drugs in the later phase. And the third is, of course, a stage treatment approach, as I introduced with the last slide, tailored to the pathophysiological changes of status. Coming to the treatment, early stages, they go well with benzodiazepines, anti-epileptic drugs, you know, the second stage, um, we have lorazepam, diazepam, clonazepam, and the anti-epileptic drugs most commonly used are levetiracetam, barproic acid, lacosamide, phenytoin, and phosphenytoin. So, in many countries, there uh, is uh, diazepam, in other countries, clonazepam, and in, in third country, it's lorazepam. Lorazepam has been regarded as first-line drug, but if you pool the data, and we did this in a meta-analysis with five different studies, and we found out that the outcome, seizure cessation after a single dose of medication, did not differ when you use diazepam as compared to lorazepam. So that's one point. If you only have diazepam in your country, you are uh, still on the safe side regarding efficacy. There may be some pharmacological advantages of lorazepam, but they don't show up here in this. 
But what is important when you have a study in the first line, uh, you use usually an appropriate dose, which is at least two, but up to eight milligram of lorazepam, for example, and 10 to 20 milligram diazepam. In the real life setting, and these are data from Austria, Germany, and Switzerland from our registry, which we have uh, for several years. Um, the first compound given was benzodiazepine, it's 86% of convulsive status. And the time, the latency between onset and treatment was half an hour in the generalized convulsive. And in the non-generalized convulsive, it was 150 minutes, so more than two hours treatment delay. That's too late. And the second point is the bolus doses were lower than recommended by the guideline in 76% and 78% of the cases. So imagine, we in Austria, Germany, Switzerland start treatment overall, these are 1,000 patients, too slow with a too low dose. And what, what is the outcome in that is that, sorry, that when you look at the outcome, on the left hand, you see cumulative ongoing status epilepticus after one hour, 60%, 70% are ongoing. It's vice versa. So usually you can control 60% with benzodiazepines, and here 60% are ongoing. It's only 40% which, uh, which are controlled. And I think the reason is too late and too low dose. And the worst thing what you can do is you use levetiracetam first, and this doesn't work in these cases. Most of them see still after one hour. Other options, uh, when benzodiazepines fail, which are clearly the first drug of choice, phenytoin, levetiracetam, varproic acid, phenobarbital, and lacosamide. So, um, phenytoin is a sodium channel blocker, acts on the fast inactivation. It has a lot of side effects, especially on the cardiac system, hypertension, and it has a nonlinear PK. Leviteracetam uh, is SV2A, vesicle uh, acting drug, but it has a low blood brain barrier permeability. Otherwise, it's very well tolerated. The usual doses are too low. You have to give 30 to 70 uh, milligram per kilogram. Valproic acid, multiple actions, phenobarbital, GABAergic drugs, and glucosamide is again a sodium channel blocker um, with a slight potential of cardiac arrhythmias, but it's not sure whether this is clinically relevant. So what to choose? The ESET trial, Established Status Epilepticus Treatment Trial, um, looked at Phosphenitoin, varproic acid, or levetiracetam in this stage after failure of benzos, and the outcome was no difference. So, around 50 to 60 percent are controlled with the first benzo. Then you move to the second stage, you control again 50 percent of the patients, irrespective with which drug you use. Uh, and uh, you may find some differences in the adverse event profile, but no, that's not a, a significant one. Four patients had life-threatening hypotension with phosphenitoin and one patient with levetiracetam. So the, again, no difference. And the plant interim analysis led to the trial being stopped because there is no difference between these three anticonvulsant medications. Another study published in Lancet last year uh, was an open-label multicenter study in New, in New Zealand looking at phenytoin and levetiracetam in children three months to 16 years in these, in these doses, and the primary outcome was cessation of seizure five minutes after the complete infusion. Levetiracetam had no advantage but no disadvantage. Similar study in UK, also open label, also children, six months to 16 years, same doses, same conclusion, no significant difference to phenytoin. So, when we look at the ESAC trial, it was already outdated when it's finished. It is a masterpiece, but newer drugs have not been implemented, for example, lacosamide, 
Here is a, a, a critical review by Adam Strelczyk. Uh, he looked at uh, all the papers we published together and uh, all the series. It's overall 522 episodes of status epilepticus, 51% uh, female, success rate 57%. Um, and the most often used bolus is 400 milligram. So um, there are many questions open, um, but this might be a good alternative. So the other way to approach this is to do a meta-analysis and make indirect comparisons. And with our friends uh, Simona Latanzi and uh, Francesco Brigo, uh, we did this, five randomized controlled trials with different interventions, all the drugs which you use here. And then we looked by network meta-analysis, which allows indirect comparison about the efficacy. Uh, this, uh, the thickness of the bar between the different treatments represents the number of patients which you have. So there are very few patients <clears throat> comparing seizure freedom between valproic acid and phenytoin, but there are more between um, diazepam and valproic acid. So that's important when you have to compare different drugs with each other. And you see that valproic acid is the most often used comparator. So when you do an indirect comparison, you have to go via the valproic acid. So what you don't see here is, uh, is the following. Uh, You see, all these comparisons, they don't make a big difference except those which are in pink. And those are the comparisons where phenobarbital is involved. So what we can conclude from this is phenobarbital was superior to phenytoin, vaproic acid, diazepam, levetiracetam, and lacosamide in respect to seizure cessation. That's astonishing. The old Phenobarb was better than anything else in this state. But it had also greater um, probabilities of being the best in achievement of seizure control and seizure freedom after that. Valproic acid and lacosamide were um, likely to be the best tolerated. Another new kit on the block is Brivaracetam. It's similar acting to Levetiracetam, but it has a higher blood brain barrier penetration. So that might translate into an advantage because the brain concentration goes faster up. And this is what you see in this experimental uh, study. So we use this, of course, and we can say that, uh, yes, it works. Uh, and we try to uh, bring it into the treatment before intensive care unit. And uh, in fact, in a meta-analysis, um, there were 37 patients overall treated with the dose 50 to 400 milligram and the success rate of 27 to 100%. What can you say out of from this? Not much, except that it is used and it might bring some additional opportunity in the treatment of status. Same is true for this drug, which again, I have to uh, it's a retrospective chart review uh, in our center. So we did this with 30 patients and we used different doses. So um, the high dose group, 20 milligram, and we use it now much higher um, per nasogastric tube. Um, and we found in many patients an unfavorable uh, result that was probably due to the, um, to the uh, underlying cause. So perampanel has the problem that you don't have an IV solution at the moment, uh, and it's, um, the company is working on that because many groups, and here is again a summary from uh, Austria, Finland, Germany, and Spain um, about the use, and there were um, 52 patients with uh, perampanel. Here you see the percentage of patients uh, with the modified ranking scale before admission from zero to five. And here you see after that uh, from zero to six. So there's a clear shift to the poor 
poorer outcomes after the status. So that underlines we need good drugs for status epilepticals. So what we see here is that in the first stage, benzos are definitely the drugs of choice. In the second stage, you have the four anti-epileptic drugs which are listed here, and then you are followed by anesthesia. So what the practice point is, is that you should not delay treatment uh, in phase three. Don't delay admission to intensive care unit by using all the four drugs sequentially in, uh, in stage two. Phenytoin takes half an hour that it's in, and that's too late to, um, to give the other ones. You have to be there on the ICU already. What do we give in the ICU? Traditionally, it's midazolam, um, it's thiopental and propofol. But we need alternatives because the mobility and mortality with these drugs is higher. So one option could be ketamine. We use, uh, um, we use S-ketamine, which S-ketamine is a racemic mix mixture. So we use the S-form, which has a higher uh, affinity, and it's an NMDA receptor blocker. Uh, that makes sense in terms of pathophysiology and it does not cause hypotension, which is another advantage. So we use this in uh, our case series where we included uh, 42 patients, 62 responded to uh, ketamine. And this is, and this is, uh, and this is, um, um, a retrospective single study. Uh, all the patients had refractory status epilepticus. So other, uh, others used that too, Gaspar, Basha, and so forth. At different doses, some of them had uh, a bolo, some of them started with a continuous infusion. There's no consensus about how to use it. Why do we like ketamine so much? Because it is the only drug which has been shown to have an influence of the cortical spreading depressions. Uh, these phenomena occur in severely injured patients with traumatic brain injury or subarachnoidal bleeding. It's a complete shutdown of cortical activity, which correlates with poor outcome. Whether this is an epiphenomenon or whether it's causally related, doesn't matter because we don't know. But what we, what we do know at the moment is that ketamine reduces or blocks it, which you see here. And these were the first studies by the group of Harding. Um, how long should we keep a patient in coma? Well, this is a complicated uh, study by my friend Dan Den Lohnstein and Saflarski, um, looking at ICUs, three centers over six year period, I looked at the primary uh, and secondary outcomes, um, a withdrawal seizure and the functional outcome at discharge in the modified ranking score. And what they found out, and, and listen, the guideline is 24 to 48 hour anesthesia. And what they found out in analyzing this extremely complex mathematical model that a deeper a therapeutic coma is independently associated with fever in hospital, with fewer in hospital complications, good, and a shorter duration, but a more profound therapeutic coma might be as effective, as safe, uh, um, as it's mentioned in the guideline, uh, where there is 40, uh, 22 to 48 hours. So 35 hours is in the middle of 24 to 48. Guidelines are correct. And this tells you that people follow the guidelines. Another important step is to search for alternatives because we have a problem in this refractory and super refractory stage. These are experimental data from dexmedetomidine, uh, which is known as Dextor in many countries, and it's used uh, when you have uh, withdrawal problems. But here it's, uh, it's used as anti-epileptic drug in a very severe seizure model um, induced by a nerve agent. Uh, when you give that, almost all the animals die. Um, but here you see that in the lower graph that they respond nicely uh, to this uh, 
uh, serin uh, kind of uh, nerve agent. So my suggestion is in the treatment schedule, in the stage three and four, refractory and super refractory, general anesthesia with midazolam or the others, we prefer midazolam plus ketamine very early on, hook on continuous monitoring or do intermittent EEG, magnesium, and then of course consider immunotherapy and all other treatments. Dexmedetomidine might be something which you can consider early, but it's unsure uh, how the effect is in humans. What is important on the other hand is when you have NORSE or FIRES, FIRES is similar to NORSE, it's a new onset refractory status epilepticus, but it has fever at the beginning or it had fever earlier when the, when the NORSE started. Consider immunotreatment. First, you have to search for the etiology. When you identify that, for example, uh, cytomegalovirus infection, then of course treat it. But if you don't do that, treat with immune modulators like methylprednisolone, IVIG, plasma exchange, and then if it doesn't work, rituximab, cyclophosphamide, anakindra, and others. So what is on the horizon? I showed you previously what is done in, in NORSE, um, it's about 77% uh, are treated with, um, or 62%, so 77 cases are treated with immune therapies. It's more than half, and that's something which is uh, important to know. Uh, one of the things we do quite early is plasma exchange and plasma pheresis which uh, is intended to separate um, the blood in order to eliminate um, circulating autoantibodies. So uh, it's mainly uh, NMDAR receptor encephalitis, limbic encephalitis with identified or without identified antibodies. And you see the clinical response uh, in our series here from a few patients uh, is quite positive, but you have to uh, accept that you need a team to do that. You need a 24 hour seven service, so it's quite demanding. Um, so when we are uh, in front of a patient with fires or NORSE, we need to push for early inflammatory treatment, anti-inflammatory treatment, and that's anakindra. Uh, Anakindra is an interleukin-1 receptor blocker or receptor antagonist. So it blocks the cytokine cascade and it has an influence on the cytokine storm. And these patients, um, this is a single patient, you see it did not respond on anything. And, uh, and when the patient received, it also uh, uh, experienced dress. So, um, after anakindra. So when you give the anakindra, seizures went down, uh, the anakindra was stopped or paused, um, and then seizures went up again. So this is a typically problematic case. You give immune treatment, it works. You have to stop immune treatment due to infection or other complications, uh, and seizures re-emerge. Anti-epileptic drugs in this case probably have no effect. And the other hopeful drug is uh, tocilizumab for NORSE. And Jin Sun Yun, a uh, nice person from Korea, um, collects these cases where um, he gives tocilizumab um, after failure of rituximab or in combinations. So what, uh, what is interesting here is that these seven cases are quite convincing uh, some of them had rituximab overall, but it was convincing that tocilizumab was the drug with, um, with the success. So the uh, status was terminated after um, one or two doses of tocilizumab. Um, another hopeful substance is on neurosteroids. Uh, neurosteroids related to progesterone, allopregnanolone, 
they have an effect on synaptic and extrasynaptic um, GABA receptors. And the extrasynaptic GABA receptors responsible for the tonic inhibition, they don't undergo these receptor changes with trafficking and reducing the number of receptors. So despite the fact that the phasic GABAergic synaptic receptors are no longer available, the extrasynaptic are still there. Well, here's a um, uh, experimental evidence that it works in a mouse model. Allopregnanolon is an, uh, uh, and its uh, synthetic analog Ganaxolon works after intramuscular um, application in the same way uh, um, as uh, allopregnanolon. So Ganaxolon is coming back again into a clinical trial. Uh, probably in the near future, and it will be very interesting to see what happens. So the other thing which you must not forget is that there are also non-pharmacological treatments, and then I come to an end. Uh, it's neurostimulation. There are cases with deep brain stimulation. There are a lot of cases with uh, vagal nerve stimulation, which is probably the most common used, um, and uh, it's the less uh, the least invasive. All the non-invasive techniques like TNS, transcutaneous vagal nerve stimulation, TMS and TDCS did not have a sustained effect. But vagus nerve overall in 43 patients, 67% reported the sensation. So what is the problem here? Publication bias. So we have two patients one responded, the other one did not respond. So if we publish that, we will have a 50% success rate. This is why we want to increase the numbers and we collect cases where a vagal nerve stimulator was implanted. We want to know whether it's working at all or whether it's a fantasy by um, a bias towards successful publications. So to conclude, Epidemiology uh, status is a common neurological emergency, but different types of status and different causes might be rare. And the super refractory status is a rare condition. The new definition guides earlier appropriate treatment and provides a framework for treatment escalation. And the diagnosis and classification is clear. Semiology, etiology and EG are the most important. Early stages benzodiazepines, and uh, in stage two, there is uh, the ESET trial, which has been published already. It was ahead of schedule, so they have stopped it because there was no difference, but lacosamide and brivaracetam was not included. Antiglutamatergic drugs are on the horizon. It's ketamine, it's perampanel, which is developed and uh, which will be developed uh, in an intravenous solution. And please consider also non-pharmacological treatment. It's stimulation, neurostimulation, neurosteroids, immunosuppressants, uh, outer antibodies, biological, um, biologica. They work in these very often immunologically mediated conditions. So if you are interested, the next Status Epilepticum, Epilepticus Symposium will be held not in April next year, but in um, at the end of the year in autumn and not in Vienna, but in Salzburg. But anyway, you're cordially welcome and it will be a very nice and, and intriguing conference. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Dr. Rinka, for the conference. It's a pleasure to hear about this exciting topic. Uh, Damos las gracias al doctor Trinca por su excelente presentación. Eh, seguiremos ahora con un ciclo de preguntas y respuestas con el doctor David Martínez. David. Ok. Eh, buenos días a todos. Eh, vamos a partir el ciclo de preguntas. Doctor Trinca, we have many questions. So, as I told you, this is a hot topic for every one of us. So, I was expecting to have all this amount of, of questions. I'm going to start with Actually, the first one I think is a good one uh, uh, regarding the, the, some of the diagnosis challenges. And he said like that, 
He said, that, uh, Dr. Trenka, thank you for the lecture. Uh, I have a question regarding the neuroimaging of status epilepticus. Is there any clue to differentiate the acute changes in brain MRI between patients with a status and patients with autoimmune encephalitis? Encephalitis. Yeah, good, good question. So I think the if you look at the earlier literature, many of them did not consider that this may be status related. Now we have collected a large series of patients and also our Italian friends with uh, Stefano Meletti and Chada Giovannini, where you clearly see that the lesions which are there correlate with the EEG activity and they are within the framework of uh, functional networks. Um, in autoimmune encephalitis, uh, it's a less well localized problem. Uh, it's in many cases a diffuse problem uh, and the topography where it's most difficult is the limbic encephalitis. Mm -hmm. As we know now is that what we see in limbic encephalitis is status related because they virtually all have status epilepticus. So you have to treat um, both immediately. Um, and uh, when you do this, uh, seizures will be controlled. Uh, and I think the, the last answer is not spoken, but in the majority of cases, what uh, I showed you is due to uh, status. Uh, and um, there are some overlap, for example, with vascular lesions, sometimes not easy to distinguish. Uh, and uh, we would try to work out an ATC uh, quotient uh, where you can decide that this is more likely to be status related and not ischemia related. But that's for the future, but it's a very good question, I agree. Yeah, uh, so thank you, Dr. Pinka. So I, I have another one um, regarding the second line treatment, the IV antiepileptic drugs. Is it, if you take into account the, the results from the ESET study, uh, what is your criteria to choose uh, the second and the second line antiepileptic drug treatment regarding all of them having the same effect or the same results? Yeah, you see, the interesting thing is um, we have to learn about where do we need to make trials. One of the entry criteria is that, uh, you know, this is a serious condition, but we need the doctors on board. So only those doctors agreed when they accepted that there is clinical equipoise. So you can convince people that, well, there's not much difference, so you can randomize. Otherwise, it would be not ethically justifiable. But what happens if doctors over the years and the community thinks that this works in the same way, with the same efficacy, a randomized controlled trial, $12 million, proved that the doctors are right in their judgment without, uh, so the, that was the entry criterion. But having said that, we now have the proof that it works and it helps patients to get the, the labeling and, and the common acceptance. My personal decision tree is we start with levetiracetam first because you you know that very early, five to 10 minutes you need for the infusion. And the second point is lacosamide, which is again also high dose, uh, fast infusion. The third is valproic acid. If they don't work, patient is in intensive care and you need 10 minutes for each drug to look at, which is the major advantage. If you use phenytoin, you need half an hour. <coughs> yeah. So I received a, um, a request, as I told you, from a, um, from Brazil. And I think there are people from Brazil also with you. Um, there's no intravenous valproic acid. It was withdrawn from the market. And there's no intravenous leveteracetam, which is a shame. So what do you do then? You, you poison uh, with uh, other drugs like high-dose midazolam or high-dose thiopental or high-dose um, propofol. So I think it's very important to say that this is an important condition. We need the drugs on the market and uh, you have to negotiate with the government uh, that this is not uh, withdrawn. Uh, the choice, uh, sorry, uh, it's, this is the usual choice and uh, it's very important about the comorbidity. 
we avoid phenytoin with all the cardiac uh, problems uh, in every patient and we um, try to avoid valproic acid if we don't know the cause. If it's an orsa and you have uh, a mitochondrial encephalopathy, this would not be the best choice. Okay, perfect. Yeah, that, that, that was very clear, actually. Thank you very much. Dr. Tinker, regarding the same point, there is a question regarding phenobarbital. That uh, if you consider the results and, and some of the uh, secondary adverse effects, the profile of the drug, do you think it, is there any role for the phenobarbital beyond the neonatal uh, neonat, neonat, uh, status epileptic treatment? Or do you think it's restricted to that group of population? Um, so, Fenobarbital is an exciting substance, I have to say, because in those regions where it is used, people can achieve a lot with that. Study-wise, it's a catastrophic item because you only have the uh, study at the early and then at the after failure of uh, benzo, uh, benzodiazepines. So there's not a lot of study support with that. In our meta-analysis, it turned out to be the most efficacious drug. So, having said that, in Austria, it's out of use due to the adverse effects and due to the tragic history that many patients were poisoned in the Nazi time with Luminal, which is the trade name uh, in Germany. So, it has a very bad reputation. Uh, it's not, uh, the drug is not guilty. It's the people who used it for these purposes. Um, so, it has been discussed a little bit. For me, phenobarbital would still be an option, especially in resource-poor countries. Um, the side effects are uh, when you have experience are, are well tolerated, but it's not, uh, it's not eligible for uh, long-term infusion. So, bolus injection, yes, good, but if it doesn't work, you have to think about something else. Perfect. So I'm going to go with the refractory status epilepticus now. Uh, I'm going to say one, one question for me. So <laughs> sorry, everybody, but I'm going to take advantage of my situation. I, I always have the, the question regarding the outcome that you need to follow when you are treating a refractory status epilepticus patient. So the question is, is quite simple. If when you are treating refractory patient, your outcome is EEG birth suppression or just seizure control, clinical and EEG? In an ideal world, it's seizure control. In the reality, which is not the ideal world, it's difficult to achieve the goal. So uh, I'm sure you cannot be 24 hours, seven days a week in the hospital next to the patient bed, right? So I, I, I cannot. Uh, uh, but you're young, you should. No, but you, you see, uh, the doctors change in the ICU. And then one doctor takes the decision that it's not enough. Oh, then you increase. When you have a breakthrough seizure, people react nervously and they many of them think, oh, well, let's, let's increase the dose. Let's go for the birth suppression. Then you have an, again a seizure out from the burst suppression, or you misinterpret the burst suppression and say, well, there are epileptic spikes, let's increase again. Thiopental, or, or uh, the equivalent, uh, which you have here, high dose barbiturates, um, they are poison. They can kill even a young, strong person uh, with toxic effects on the heart, on the liver, on the metabolism, multi organ failure, metabolic acidosis. So um, try, don't put the patient into an isoelectric EEG. Uh, no. I think it works when you have the goal seizure suppression or maximum seizure reduction. Um, if it doesn't work with the first, let's say, 24 to 48 hours barbiturates, switch to something else. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, another question regarding NORS. Uh, one of the doctors asked, when we see the large cohorts of these patients, it seems that the functional outcome is almost the same between cryptogenic and symptomatic etiology. Is it possible that cryptogenic and symptomatic NORS are the same entity? 
Well, uh, you see, again, in the best of all words, everything has a cause. Um, the only problem is that we don't know the cause in these cases, and it's definitely not idiopathic, which is uh, gene-related, developmental gene-related. Uh, it's something which is uh, acquired, to my opinion, and uh, why do I believe that? Because you have one picture which looks typically Norse and you get uh, uh, autoimmune antibody. And in another, which looks exactly the same, you cannot identify the antibody. But nevertheless, you can assume that they have the same cause based on the similarity. And they have also very similar outcome because sometimes what we do is um, we come too late with our treatments uh, and then, well, it doesn't matter whether we are uh, at the, you know, early on or, or later on because the brain is already damaged severely. This is why the functional outcome might be the same. Um, what you see in cases is that you can control the seizures earlier, but the functional outcome is still poor. So the idea in the community is now to use the immune treatments earlier and earlier. So we, the case we have now at our ICU, we started the immunotherapy on day four, on day four, which is very early in, in uh, when you compare it. But what did we do? We did immunoglobulins, then we see, then we did plasma separa uh, separation and simultaneously um, methylprednisolone. Uh, oh, Mar is here. She's the next one, or no? Um, then uh, we do methylprednisolone, and we started after 10 days, 14 days, tocilizumab. So maybe that's too late, and we should consider on um, treatment protocols which are earlier and earlier. So that's, uh, I think, one worth a, a thought. It's food for thought. Um, but the question is good and the observation is also good. So there must be an explanation for that. And uh, my interpretation would be that both are uh, symptomatic. Perfect. Yeah, I, I actually agree. Um, Dr. Trinka, I'm, I'm going to come back a little bit to the diagnosis. Is there, a, there, there is a question regarding the benzodiazepine trial in patients that when you are not clear from the EEG standpoint and the and the clinical point the clinical standpoint you are not totally sure if this is a patient with a status or not so uh, what is your recommendation for the benzo trial because it, it appears that in in some of the experience here the benzo trial is not really that easy to do patients go fall asleep and it, it, it could be quite complicated actually I think you commented on that on one of your articles yes. So that's, uh, of course, uh, you identified one of the weak spots of this definition. To include, and we thought a long time about it, to include a drug response as a diagnostic criterion uh, would mean that the most refractory show no drug response, so they are no, not status, which is, of course, wrong. It's an additional indicator that you can modify the epileptic activity. With all the problems, with all congranosalis, what you um, what you mentioned, that you put the patient into sleep and then the pattern re-emerges. Um, when you have epileptic, when you have a, a metabolic encephalopathy, you have triphasic waves, you give benzos and they tune down, they disappear and then they reappear. So the anti-epileptic drug response in no direction, whether it responds it's not the proof of status. And whether it does not respond, it's not the exclusion of status. So it's just an additional element which you have to combine in your overall view. And it's a small element, to my opinion, because when you can change the EEG, disappear, a patient wakes up in when you give, for example, valproic acid in, in some cases, then you don't need the EEG anymore because the patient is awake. So it's more important to see whether you can modify the EEG pattern, and this is what we have to search for. Perfect. Very good. Um, I think I'm gonna, uh, in, in interest of time, I'm gonna do a, a, a two more questions, and, and then we can finish. So there is 
there's some question regarding a stage four treatment in the status epilepticos. I'm going to link two, que two questions. One of those said, if you think there is any role for the hypothermia in this kind of patients. And the other one uh, asked about cetogenic diet, keto diet. Yeah. Okay, good question. First, uh, it's easy. There are render, There is a, a trial published in New England Journal of Medicine where uh, hypothermia did not have an improved outcome. Um, what I would do, what we do as a state of the art or SOP, it's controlled temperature management because fever and high metabolic demand is not good for the brain either. So we don't cool the patient down to uh, 30 degree or 31 degree or 32. We just make a controlled normothermia and we try to avoid fever wherever we can. And if there is a fever occurring, you have to think about whether it's infectious or status related or has other causes. So rhabdomyolysis also can occur with uh, barbiturates, for example. Uh, and that can increase the body temperature. So that's fever is an important clinical sign. Um, simply to control the fever is not is not the right thing. You have to search for the causes and treat the causes and the fever, but not hypothermia. Second point was ketogenic diet. Well, that's uh, important. The results are so heterogeneous. And in childhood epilepsy syndromes, it's definitely worthwhile to consider. There are a few papers on adults with um, NORSE where ketogenic di diet was, um, was able to perform, um, but not in every patient. So when you have a severe multi, um, multi morbid patient with multi organ failure, it's extremely difficult to keep up a ketogenic diet. And most of the time, we um, we went back to normal diet in these patients. So that's probably something. The more often you do it in children, the more often you see responder. But in adults, I would say it's less convincing and uh, extremely painstaking, and it causes a lot of metabolic derangement. And you don't know where the target is. Whether the target is. Um, uh, acidosis or whether the target is the level of decanoic acid, it's unclear. So less convinced about that one. Perfect. And one last question, and I think it, this question is, is, is resume a little bit our experience in, in Latin America. It actually was super noticing to me when I arrived in the United States. Uh, people here in the United States uh, don't use propofol for stage uh, three patients. So, but we in South America, we use it and, and actually I think we do pretty well with the, with the medication. So what's your experience about it and what is your opinion to use it? Because uh, it seems to be pretty good to, to achieve your EEG outcome, especially. Yeah, yeah. So Propofol, I absolutely agree with you. Um, I think uh, the ICU treatment, which you find in the US centers, uh, is very often very conservative. Not all of them, uh, but, but you find it more often to be conservative than you find it of advanced level. Um, I don't know why they are so, um, let's say, reluctant to propofol. Uh, in Europe, it's uh, number one, followed by midazolam. Um, as I told you previously, my personal preference is midazolam because of the you avoid the propofol infusion syndrome and you can go extremely high without doing any harm to the patient. So it's two to four to even six milligram per kilogram per hour has been reported. So that's uh, about the, you know, it's the, the 20 fold anesthetic dose which you use for short time. Um, uh, narcosis induction. So I think it's a, a reasonable um, order to have midazolam first. My, uh, propofol has an advantage, of course, because it is very well anti-epileptic. The downside is that when you're not used to this, uh, it makes some movements um, yes. which resemble epileptic uh, jerks or myoclonic jerks, but they are 
a different mechanism. And then in many centers, they increase and uh, they call the neurologist and say, well, this was a seizure. We have to do something about that. It's not the, not truly a seizure. Uh, and the proper for infusion syndrome, as you all know, there are certain limits for a long uh, standing proper for infusion. Perfect. Wonderful. I, I, I don't know, Dr. Jinka, I, I, we, we have a lot of questions, but I think that in interest of time and, and respecting your uh, your other business, we, we need to we need to end here. So, Paolo, I'm going to pass you the microphone to you and I'm going to thank you for all, all, all your answers. I think it's, it was wonderful for us to, to have your view about this little issues that sometimes are difficult to find in the articles, but it's good to discuss it face to face. OK, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Trika, for your conference. Uh, it's a pleasure to hear you. Eh, estamos en tiempo. Eh, agradecemos la importante convocatoria que tuvimos con, con este webinar. Agradecemos también las preguntas y especialmente al doctor Trinca por su tiempo y una presentación brillante en realidad. Y eh, si alguien necesita revisar la presentación completa, eh, puede hacerlo a partir de ahora. Eh, y además vamos a subir algunas de las presentaciones de, los, de, la, de las antiguas conferencias que se realizaron, que algunos de los presentadores eh, tuvieron el gusto de eh, que podamos subirlas para compartirlas con el resto. Eh, por último, eh, lo invitamos para nuestro siguiente webinar que se realizará la próxima semana, el próximo miércoles 26 a las 14 horas de Chile, con la exposición de la doctora Mar Carreño con el tema de neuromodulación eh, en el tratamiento de la epilepsia refractaria. Así que ahí nos vemos. Que estén muy bien, que tengan buena tarde. Gracias.